never stays a day A bad luck's always a coming my way And what we're looking at in about the center of that hillside is Cielo Drive, where back in 1969, the Manson family murdered actress Sharon Tate and five other people, one of them being her unborn son. In fact, you see this house right here? That's where the house once stood in Cielo Drive. It's been torn down and a new one has been built. It's now owned, well that mammoth house is now owned by Jeff Franklin, the guy who created Full House. Technically, unless you live on Cielo Drive, they ask you not to drive it. It is a private drive. There is no through street, so we're gonna be parking on the bottom and getting a little exercise in up to the gates of where the house once stood, which is perfect because it's gonna give us a little bit of time to get better acquainted with the story of what happened there in 1969. Right from the get-go, I can tell you right now that the street sign looks a lot different from what I saw online. I actually kind of like it. Private road, no through traffic, which is why we're parking down here and walking up. The house address now, the property address I should say, is 10066, but back then it was 10050. That night, 1969, when the Manson family got here, they drove their car up to the gate at the end of Cielo Drive where Sharon Tate and her friends were. They cut the phone lines and then they backed the car all the way back down this road so it wouldn't be seen. Now, if you're familiar with our videos, you know that I don't like to bog you guys down with all kinds of different facts. You can find all that stuff online. Instead, I'm all about going and experiencing the place and taking you with me. See what it's like now compared to the way it was back then. This road is very peaceful. Now I'm not gonna film my entire walk up this road because it is a bit of a trek. But just imagine that back in 1969, Sharon Tate, Roman Polanski, Sebring, Folger, a whole bunch of famous people driving up this road. If this road could talk. Now before we get any closer, forget everything you know about this house on Cielo Drive. Any video that you have watched, forget everything you know about it because it's all wrong. Now, 1994, the house that Sharon Tate and her friends died in was completely razed. They turned everything inside out. They dug up all the dirt. They churned all the dirt. This gate, which everybody comes here to, is not even the real gate. It's not even in the, the original location where the gate used to stand. The gate used to be a little bit further back. But this is it, 10066. On this property, that's the only thing you can really say, on this property is where all the murders happened. Mind blowing. Now, I wanna draw your attention to this telephone pool that's over here, you see it? When Manson's followers got here that night, they climbed this telephone pole and they cut the telephone wires and then they backed the car all the way back down the driveway. But remember what I said about forget everything that you know about this place? Everybody comes here and says, oh look, it's that telephone pole. In all actuality, the telephone pole back in 1969 was on the other side of the driveway, right over here. Once they took the car all the way back down, they snuck on the property by climbing this hillside where that fence is to get over there. Crazy. Now, if we look up here, I'm not gonna go any further, but further back is where the original gate used to be.
before Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski rented the house that used to be here on this property, a whole bunch of other celebrities used to live here. And even so, after they were gone, the last resident, believe it or not, that used to live in the house was Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. All this information you can find very easily online. He rented it in 1992, I do believe, and he recorded the album, The Downward Spiral, here on the property. Moved out in 1993 and the house was torn down ultimately in 1994. But before Trent Reznor left, he took the famous door with him. And then he put it in his recording studio in his house in New Orleans. Honestly, there's really not much that can be seen to this day. Everything here is 100% different. The only thing that remains is the history of what happened here. Was it in the movie Portergeist, you only move the headstones? You can tear down the house, you can rebuild a house, but it still doesn't change the fact that six people brutally died on this property in 1969. It changed the world. Not just Los Angeles, not just Hollywood, it changed the world. Even though the original gates are long gone, it is nice to see that there are gates here now. Or if you wanted to, you can come here and pay your respects. Right now I'm standing on David Oman's back balcony on the top floor. What I find very interesting, if you look, oh, let's see if I can point this out, way, way over there. Let's see, right about in there. Nope, I'm sorry, right there. That's where we started this video out. That's how far away we were on the other side of the canyon. But just look at this view. You know, I'm obsessed with the views here in California. Every single day, I'm just like, holy crap. Look at all this. And the fact that you have this every single day, I, I don't know if I could do it. The only thing I really enjoy is not the city views, but the, the wildlife, to be able to see the foxes, the coyotes, the bobcats, the deer running across the, the hill there and around this area. That's what I find totally, you know, the value of living up here. I personally don't care for the views of the city because <laughs> I'm not in, into the asphalt jungle, but I love the views of the canyon and the wildlife. Like I said, we have the red-tailed hawk and the crows and the ravens that fly right, swoop right down in front of the house here. It's just great. And if I may, yeah. just pointing out, because you were showing me before, <laughs> Dr. Phil lives right up there. Yeah. That's a neighbor. Yeah. Uh, right over here. What was this place again? Falcon Lair. Falcon Rudolph Valentino's home. What's yeah. left of it. Crazy. And then Richard Anderson the, um, from the Six Million Dollar Man, that's where he used to live. Right there. And that deck, you see that big square deck? Right yeah, right there on the top. Richard used to sit on there on a chaise lounge during the sunny summers and the sunny days of winter. <laughs> Literally, from tip of the top of his head to the tip of his toes, he was wearing a pair of swim trunks and literally bathed in cocoa butter <laughs> and was worshiping the sun to the day he moved out of there. I think he was like 97 years old, when he, 96 or 97 when he moved out. But he was great because Richard would be on the telephone and I'd be on my balcony talking to my friends and the voices carry so well up the canyon. So I'm like this on the phone and my friend says, turn off the goddamn television. I can hear it. said, what? He goes, I can hear the commercial with Richard Anderson. I said, that's not a commercial. That's Richard live right down below me on, the, on his, oh, on his awesome. rooftop taking his son and he's taking you know, calls on the phone. And my friend goes, God, he sounds like he's on the TV. I recognize his voice. <laughs> he was great. And that house down there is Rudolph Valentino's stables and his kennels. Oh, right down just, there where it looks like they're doing some construction? They just ripped off the roof and they redid the entire roof there, which is almost Crazy. 100 years old. And, you, and I don't know if you guys can see this, but we were just talking right over here on the top of this building. There's cars parked on the roof, which is, you know, kind of strange. But you see this little, like, white blip? What were you telling us about that? That's a security robot that literally motor, motors around the property searching out for vandals and incursion, you know, in, incursionites, you know, people that incurred, have, have in, have made the incursion onto the property. They don't really like people on there. It's, it's crazy because there used to be lots of times where I'd be out on the balcony in the middle of the night and hear the helicopters flying over with the uh, artificial sun beaming on that property and the cops walking the property looking for people and flashlights going and going, 
what, what are you doing? What's going on down there? What's so important? But they went and spent 25 grand and got themselves a security robot on top of the roof. That's I want a security robot. Yeah, I can't imagine how he'd manage in my house. He'd be one floor only. <laughs> Can you navigate stairs there, sweetheart? Otherwise, you're stuck to the floor that you're on. Very, that's wild. Yeah. It blows my mind living here. So, much respect. Well, vice versa for what you do and your, your what you do and your with your blogs. My God, much respect to you. I enjoy your work and I, I enjoy your take on the different locations you investigate and the different histories that you uh, review. It's fascinating. Oh, I'm very you. impressed with it. I was so funny. I was like, I've seen him before. Oh my God! I said him. I said I just watched this video two weeks ago about this location you went to, and I was like, on. Oh, that's too funny. So I was watching your YouTube channel earlier and I noticed that you have these figures up here. I saw them online and you have a camera here as well. Can you right. tell me a little bit about this? Well, originally these figurines were just the one Beetlejuice, the one Smoking Man, the one Alec Baldwin, the one Gina Davis, and the one Shrunken Head Man. And they were put up about 12 years ago for Halloween. And what happened was, is I started noticing that each figure would, on, on their own would be knocked over. And I couldn't understand it. And so I put up a camera in front of here about seven years ago to capture the activity. And we have had so much craziness. Now, what's interesting is, is as much as I bang on these, nothing happens. They're not getting moved over. This one, which is the lightest, you'd expect to get flopped over quickly and easily. He stays up the longest time before these characters do. Now, how many of these cameras do you have in the house? 25 inside the house and five on the outside. So anything that happens here? Is with the lights on or off, day or night, with audio and infrared video, we capture it always. That is amazing. And what's more interesting is, is most of the time of late, I'm not even looking, doing a, an active investigation with anybody here. And a friend will visit and this. The one that never really falls down. And you just saw me knocking and banging away. And there's nothing under here. By the way, I just want to show the audience. There's nothing underneath here that is an actuator that's making these figurines get knocked over or anything. And they're not staged. They're not glued into the ground or anything. And there we will leave him there. And that's, that generally does not take place. That's not usual. I can't be... I've had that happen maybe once or twice in about a hundred <laughs> knockovers where I'm here talking to somebody and then it's like, bang, it's like, thank you, yeah, appreciate it, you know, you made my point. Um, and that's interesting, of course, because when we came in, these two figurines were knocked over and he was standing up quite a bit and he's been up for about a week and a half now, untouched. So that's what's so interesting and funny about it. <laughs> well, just, thank you. Thanks, spirits. I guess they really have a. They really enjoy your presence. They're listening. They enjoy your company because this is, has more to do with you, since I'm a constant, and you're the variable in the equation that comes into this situation, and that occurs. That's a, more having to do with your presence here than anything else. Well, thank you. And it might be somebody that's around you that's deceased that's letting you know that they're here and they're present and is saying, "Hey." How's that to let you know we're here with you? <laughs> that's amazing. That's, that's very fortuitous and very, very, it's a good omen, pardon my pun, but. Ah. Uh, all right. By the way, this is the Doors hallway. This is all original Doors memorabilia. The photograph signed by the four members of the band. Oh, shit, I have to fix this. It's obviously dropped from inside, but these are all posters. Um, that's my bedroom, which is a disaster, but. Uh, Oh, all right, all right, take in here first. You have to excuse me, I'm doing laundry today. No, you're good. You son of a bitch. All right. So I saw a bunch of different things. Yes. About, right, so, so I saw a bunch of videos. videos dealing with this little hallway online this morning whenever I was doing all kinds of different research on you. What's going on? I see you shaking your head. You've got some... I have no idea what's going on. You're asking me. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you. <coughs> I don't lay claim to being an expert in anything, and I don't claim to know what the hell is going on here. I just know it's natural, and I can't explain it. But literally, last night, when 
When, when the people were here last night visiting, they took one step up here and she started walking. She goes, oh my God, I can, it's getting intense. And I said, I just said, really? And I didn't want to lead on is I don't want to lead on to you what happened. Right. I want you to feel it for yourself. Secondly, it's right now about one in the afternoon. Might be totally different 12 hours from now in the evening when the energy gets a little more amped up. I don't know. So I'm saying, you know, take a walk down this hallway and see what you feel. And I'm not going to say anything because people have accused me. You're telling people it. of what feeding, you're, you're predisposing their, their, their fears. And it's like, all right, fine. I'll say not a goddamn thing. You go through and you say, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling this. It's like, and, I'll, and like I said, once we get through this room, I'll tell you whether you're, you know, what, what other people have experienced. Yeah, try the end of the hallway, right near that door. And that door leads to the outside of the house. That staircase on the side that I showed you earlier. What are you feeling? Or are you feeling anything at all? I feel like I'm doing this. Almost like you're on a boat it's rocking back and back forth. Back and forth, yeah. Like you're like like it's like it's uneven. This is totally level, mind you. There's nothing that's not normal about this being anything of nor of not yeah. level. I feel like I'm you know how you see those carnival mirrors where you stand in front and it gives you that distorted look? I feel like Inside I'm, your head, inside yeah, here, I not am with the your mirror. eyes. Take a walk down to this side and see what happens on that end. Fee, come on, Ray, come on. Clear out, Reggie. Fee, come on, go. Yeah, because I'm feeling the same thing. I'm feeling it in my templar, templar, temple area of my head, right here, like waves coming in. Yeah. It's like, it's like, and making me feel uneasy. It's, it's like you're, you're being distorted, like you yourself. A feeling in your head, right. Isn't that strange? Wild experience. That was happening last night. They were feeling the same exact thing. And I, again, I didn't tell them. I said, what are you feeling? It's strange. It is definitely very strange. And it's very pervasive today. It's like, wow. This is my office. This is all dedicated to Jack Johnson, the uh, oh first African-American heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Oh, my head's still ringing from that. Oh. Morrison, how the... Uh, Morrison, Jim, how the fuck are you? I swear to God, I have not heard from you in so many... Yeah, pre-COVID was the last time I spoke to you. Where you been? The dark side of the moon. Are you just pulling my leg or are you just talking about the uh, Pink Floyd album? Oh, really? The dark side of the moon. Oh, cool. Well, look, I got John Belushi on the other line. Let me call you right back. Cool. Thanks. Belushi, how the hell are you? <laughs> that was Jim Morrison t tapping in. He was on the dark side of the moon. Look, I've got company over right now. I'm doing a, a, a blog for somebody. So what's a blog? Um, it's like an interview that goes live on an individual's website on a channel. A channel. No, not television channel. Look, look, I, I don't have time for this right now, John. I'll fill you in on this in a few hours, Okay. All right, I'll call you back. Thanks. Bye. Never ending. Just never ending. You know, this is the ghost. This is the poltergeist agent. That's what, because ba Zach Baggins claimed that I was possessed. I said, hey, I, and he says I'm a poltergeist agent. I Wait, said, he claimed that you were possessed. Yeah. And now you see it on every show. He's becoming possessed and more possessed on every episode of Ghost Adventures. And I'm like, you managed to last here three hours of your six hour lockdown for that episode that you shot here. You've got to be kidding me, Baggins. You gotta be kidding me. They ran out of this house, terrified and scared, like, we have enough evidence, we, we, we're, we're, we're done. We're f I said, but you have three hours left in your investigation. Goes up, no, we got plenty. We got, we got plenty of footage. So you're saying the, your dogs won't go down here? Well, look what he just did. He just ran up the steps? Yeah. This one over here is just looking a little scared. She's looking a little concerned. Look what she you okay? does. <laughs> Isn't that strange? I mean, All I right. dragged her down here and brought her here, but he won't come down here to save his ep soul, his ever-loving soul. House at the end of the drive. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, wow. Ooh, wow, woo, wow, woo. I don't know if you feel any different than you did when you were in the floor above us, but I certainly know that I'm 
It's a lot more freer to breathe down here. Right, but what about anything else is physically? Do you feel anything different than what you did upstairs, energy-wise? If not now, tonight you might feel differently because when we came down last night, they, they were saying it's a lot more intense, the energy in this room. and um, Suffocating me. a little bit, as a matter of fact, she said. <clears throat> you know how like whenever you get sick and your nose is stuffed up, Congestion and then, pressure in your sinuses. And then you take the medicine and that, that split moment where you can feel like it opens up, that's what I feel like. But it's different. It's definitely different than different, the floor. Completely different. Isn't that interesting? Let me show you in the guest bedroom. This is the place where Zach dropped, where Nick came in here, Groff, during the Ghost Adventures show and had his nuclear meltdown right here on the bed. And was looking in that room from here and said, I see something walking around in that room and I can't, I, I don't want to go in there. And then he threw his phone, his camera down. He was like, no, come down and get me. I can't handle this. Because there's only one way up, and it's back there. And it's not that far out to go here, seven feet, and go there, 20 feet, and up the stairs. But he was having a meltdown of mass proportions. Yeah, this is all still dress set from the uh, 50th anniversary of the Sharon Tate murders. For instance, that's an original 1968 uh, velvet uh, blacklight poster. That one behind you with the emperor, the sorceress is original. The um, Black Panther over there is original. The Stoned Again is original. The Magic Mushroom poster is original. Um, we are all mad is original from that era, from the '60s. That poster, I think that also is also from the '60s as well. And it's got black lights in this room, so when it goes full dark and you hit the black lights, the whole room glows. Ah, that's cool, that's cool. But we've had so many people have so many experiences in this room. Um, between a woman coming in here and having a meltdown, trying to walk out, there are three other people in here, they're talking and saying they, they feel there's some definite energy, negative energy at the door. And you see this woman go like this, and then she walks back and she goes like this. Then she comes back and she tries to walk out and she stops and she goes like this, walks over here, and then is pressed against the mirror and starts screaming at the top of her lungs. The people here are like, what's the matter? I'm standing here, I'm like, I go, what's the matter? What? I just walked in and I said, are you okay, are you okay? And she goes, ah. And her daughter comes in the room and I said, later I said, what happened? She goes, there was a man yelling in my ear. I said, so what did you, what did you do? And she goes, I decided to yell back at him. <laughs> oh my and then in the same in this room where Nick was again a friend of mine came by on a, my birthday party a few years ago and he stood right here and he's like going oh, I can't I can't breathe I can't breathe I can't breathe he ran into there and he's like oh. I said what happened he goes it felt like somebody wrapped a wet towel or wet leather wrap around me and I was, I was inhaling and as I was exhaling it wouldn't allow me to inhale and I couldn't catch my breath. And the same, and these are videos that I have, well his I don't have on video, but I have the next incident, um, another birthday a few years later, the same girl and her boyfriend, or her husband were here, and my friend Tim Rose and his wife were in this room, that they came downstairs from the middle of a party going on, and when I go ghost hunting, they're all four on the video camera, sitting here on the, the uh, bed, they have this keyboard, this little kid's keyboard that was left from the Poltergeist DVD Blu-ray event here. And they're talking, and my friend Tim starts to goes, I ain't afraid of no ghosts. Something to that effect. And then the camera on the wall over there, you can hear this man's voice says, Hello? What are you doing in my bedroom? No way. And that camera recorded it. Her digital recorder recorded it. And then two seconds later, the keyboard starts playing on its own, which turns her inside out. And she goes, ah, screaming so loud. It's like, oh my God, turn the volume down. And that, it's on my YouTube channel. You can check this shit out. And oh, heck yeah. You got to look it up. And it's amazing because it was right here in the room. And we've had other people, oh, my key grip for my movie was dragged up to the corner of the ceiling by an unseen force. And he was living here for two and a half weeks during the filming of the movie. And... He later on told us six months later that every morning at the crack of dawn, somebody would walk into the room and pull at his feet. The last night he was here, we had a seance and nothing happened. He went to bed. He says, I found myself, I put myself on that side, on this side of the bed and I fell asleep. Within five minutes, I feel my body being dragged up to the corner of the ceiling and I start screaming, 
put me down, put me down. No, and I hear a voice say, you're coming with us. And he goes, I find myself sitting bolt upright in bed on the opposite side of the mattress. <laughs> and I said, I said, but you're a skeptic. He goes, yeah, I'm a huge skeptic. I'm South African and I can't believe, I don't believe in ghosts. And he was like six foot two, six three, and about 250 pounds. Yeah. And was a complete skeptic. And I was like, now what do you think? He goes, I don't know what to make of it. I'll See? show you the video. If you want, go back to my office. I can queue up the videos and show you. Them. And it's on your YouTube channel. And it's crazy. Like I said, the fact that he was such a skeptic and it took him six months to tell us what happened in here. Oh, yeah. Right on this spot before that whole piece was on that wall. During the filming of the movie, we used this as the makeup artist's room. So the makeup artist, whose name was Natalie Wood. I kid you not. That's her real name. She <laughs> Coincidence. Had she had two makeup tables there against the wall. And they are three foot, I think they're three foot, yeah, three foot by three foot mirrored um, carriages almost. They're like a big table. They have the, the drawers and stuff, and there's two of them. On the one that was on the right, she had a photograph of Sharon Tate, a black and white photograph. She said that during, the, uh, during one of the makeup sessions, she had Jennifer sitting there, and she was doing her makeup, and she looked up at the mirror, and she says, I, after she left, she goes, I looked in the mirror, and on the right-hand, upper right corner, I saw a color image of Sharon Tate. And she goes, wait a second, I don't have a color image. I have a black and white eight by 10, and it's not on the right side of the mirror, it's in the upper left corner. So she looks to the upper left corner, sees the black and white photo of Sharon Tate that she was using for reference. Right. She looks back to the right and she says the color image of Sharon was gone. And she said, you know, remember when we wrapped? I said, yeah, she goes, who was the first person out of the house? I said, you. <laughs> and she goes, that's why it's, this is, she told us six months later what happened here. I said, you're kidding? She goes, uh-uh. She goes, I remember I said, you grabbed all the three PAs and you had them hauling your stuff out of here. As soon as they said, all right, that's a wrap. We're done with the movie. And you blew out of here like nobody's business. And she goes, yeah. She goes, I couldn't stand another day in that house. Crazy. Oh, wow. It's, um, it's pretty intense now this morning. I don't know if you can feel anything, but I can. I'm not going to say what I'm feel feeling. To it. Yeah, but I mean, I'm feeling like my whole body's feeling it. I can just feel this, like, wow, like walking into to a room of jello and having the jello just adhere to your whole body. I can feel my, oh, it's, it's thick today. What is this? That's an altar. Originally, when um, we built the house, my dad wanted to turn this into a kitchenette, which it is now. This but little... 19 years ago when we were building the house, or 20 years ago when we were building the house, he and I had a pissing contest because he says, I'm going to turn this whole floor into, a, into a, an apartment. And I said, I didn't wire that whole room for surround sound for a big screen. This is a pre theater room, Pops. Yeah. He goes, well, you're going to rent out this floor. And he says, I said, no, I'm not. And he goes, well, then I'm not going to put this kitchenette here and I'm going to leave it here looking as unbecoming as it is now. And I said, fine, I don't care. And so he left this as a storage space and he never enclosed this whole area. And so it was trying to like push me into making this into a kitchenette, into a third level apartment. I said, no, that I left it here. Well, since that time, about um, well, it was seven years ago, I dug out this whole area because the mountain used to literally come right to this spot right here. But I wanted more room in here. So we excavated it out. And originally this altar to the Native American who is supposedly interred in this mound of earth here is been moved from about two, three, four feet down below up to there. What that is because is when Lisa Williams was here, the famous English psychic, she came here in 2006, 15 years ago after the episode of Ghost Hunters, the first show that was on about the house. And she said, I have to see this house. So I said, fine. I said, you're not doing it for your TV show? Please come right ahead. So she came in with her manager and she went through the house and when she came in here, she sat here and she's like this. And she goes, oh, do you know there's a Native American on horseback that's interred and buried in this mound of earth? And I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, he tells me that, you know, several hundred years ago, he was walking across the driveway, which is now the driveway, which was a horse path. And his horse lost its footing. And they both tumbled down the slope of the mountain and broke their necks and died. And she says they were stopped, their bodies were stopped by a tree. 
Well, if you notice right over there to the right, there is a tree that used to be there. There's a stump of a tree that's there yeah. that we cut down when we built the house. And she says, oh, he's, he's very much present here. His remains were, you know, he decayed and his bones and the horse's bones were covered through the years through the mudslides. When we excava excavated this whole mound of earth out, you can actually see the layers of mud that have come down upon this hill to make this hill a little taller and thicker. And no, I have not decided to go in and excavate this whole mound of earth to find if his bones are in there. It's of no consequence to me. I just take it with a grain of salt right. and accept it. But after she came in, other psychics came in, like Jackie Barrett from America's Psychic Challenge. Christopher Fleming with um, came by to visit. Uh, James Von Prague came with Larry King Live to do an episode here. And Von Prague was the greatest because Von Prague comes in here and he's like, his demeanor just like changed on a dime. He's like going, there's a Native American in this mound of earth. I got to get out of here. Whew, and flies out of here. And I'm like going, that was the fastest I've ever seen a psychic come, come in and out of here. And literally 10 seconds, he was here. He got the vibe. He was like, pew. Flew out, and I'm thinking, God, that's never happened with anybody else. Like Christopher Fleming is like, oh, there's a Native American here on horseback. I can definitely feel his presence. And I didn't want to mention anything on the show when we shot Ghost Hunters, but because, yeah, he's here. I can feel it. And I'm thinking Jackie Barrett from America's Psychic Challenge, same thing, and all these other different people. And I'm like, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag because I don't think that Lisa Williams talks to Jackie Barrett, talks to right? Christopher Fleming. They're all pretty much as I've known, noticed about all psychics, they're pretty much to themselves. There's not like a group of a party house where all the psychics get together and, you know, share their stories. We got a dinner this weekend, Psy guys. Psychics don't generally like to talk to other psychics because they're very, and I'm just saying this from my own personal experience, um, self-centered. In a sense, it's not, it's almost there's a competition, but it's an unspoken competition. Right. But it's like, I don't talk to this psychic. I don't talk. And I can understand why. Because everybody has their own tools and mechanisms by which they work. And to compare them to somebody else just makes them feel, you know, not, I don't want to say inadequate, but different. Mm -hmm. And there's just that, there's a limited resource pool for, for people that are having readings. So the idea that you're friends with other psychics doesn't really work because you're in competition for those those dollars, so to speak. And that's what I felt. But it's kind of interesting. So that... I'm having these experiences, and finally when Zach Baggins comes in in 2013, I'm like, all right, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I'm going to tell him about the Native American and the Lisa Williams story and make it public, which was the worst thing to do because he turned around and said, your house is built on Native American ceremonial burial ground. That's a no-no. And I said, no, no, that's not what I said. I said, one guy had oh, an man. accident and died here, and his remains are interred on the earth. That's not, and I watched the episode, and I'm like, Oh my God, he said that. That son of a dumb lying. And I said, why would Native Americans have to forcibly find the most in a, in a, un inaccessible place to bury their deceased right. on the slope of a hill some 50 feet down where you'd have to literally, you know, repel yourself down and then dig all... It's like, no, they didn't. And that's just not the fact. So, you know, it is what it is. Before we ended the video, I wanted to take a quick drive up to where Rudolph Valentino lived, which gives us a really nice view of Cielo Drive. Jeff Franklin's house, the property where Sharon Tate and her friends died, is right there. And the house that we were just in, the David Omen house, is this one right there. Absolutely gorgeous. Cannot, I know I keep saying it, but I cannot get over the views. But if we walk up this way here, didn't realize this was going to be like this until we got up here. But this is where Rudolph Valentino lived. Here's the gates to it. I like how it says, Falcon Lair. Beautiful, right? I keep saying it. It's just, it's because it is. It's absolutely beautiful here. <sighs>
Oh, to dream. I'd love to live in a place like this. And with that, thank you for joining us on another adventure, this time to Cielo Drive, where Sharon Tate and her friends were brutally murdered in 1969. As always, until next time, happy Halloween. Wherever I come, I've had luck. Just come my way. Wherever I go, hard luck. Is that it stays? Good luck never stays a day. A bad luck's all.